Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'm Christian, and I will be talking for the first part of this merge talk. And I will be presenting this work, which was a joint work between me and all of these people that you see here. And it's about classical shadows using uh, logarithmically deep quantum circuits. So first of all, uh, classical shadows is a protocol that was proposed by uh, Robert Wang, uh, Kung, and Preskill uh, in 2020, in which one can use randomized measurements to get a classical representation of some unknown quantum state. Uh, and by classical representation, I mean that later, when somebody comes over with an observable, the classical data on the computer can be used to estimate the expectation value of the observable. And I'm going to very briefly describe uh, how this works more in detail. As I said, it's based on randomized measurements. So uh, one first draws a unitary from some unitary ensemble, which I call curl U. Uh, and how do we choose this? I will talk about later. We apply the unitary to the state, and we measure in the computational basis, which results in some measurement result. And then we revert the rotation. And this is the state that we actually store on the classical computer. And for the purpose of this talk, I will call this state a classical snapshot, S. We uh, repeat this process many times and times, and the classical data that we collect is called a classical shadow. This is a, a set of n of these snapshots. And uh, what is shown in this paper by Juan Kunk and Preskill is that a classical shadow of polynomial size is already enough to contain uh, a lot of important information about the state. But how do we extract this information? Uh, so given an observable, how do we actually uh, compute its expectation value? Well, the process mapping a state to a classical snapshot is a random one. There's randomness in the choice of unitary, and there's randomness in the measurement result. Uh, but on average, we can see it as the application of a quantum channel to the state. And the output of this channel, called the measurement channel, you can see it as a, a classical mixture of all possible output snapshots weighed by their uh, probabilities of showing up. So you can imagine that you are able, on the classical computer, to uh, actually simulate the action of this channel by simply taking the empirical average of all of these snapshots, since they are drawn from this probability distribution. But what's even more interesting is that under the right condition, this, classical, this, uh, this data acquisition process can be classically inverted. And by that, I mean that you can literally find, as a linear map, the inverse of this M channel, which allows you to construct these variables which average exactly to the state. So this is the, the principle behind classical shadows. And from this, it's easy to see that given an observable, we can construct a random variable, which I would call O hat, that averages to the correct expectation value. Right, so from the classical data, we can now estimate expectation value of observables. But if we suppose that we actually want to uh, do this in practice, apply this protocol, there is uh, a number of things that we need to be able to do. So first of all, from raw, we want to extract this classical shadow. And the basic requirement to do this is that we must be able to implement unitaries from this curly U ensemble. And once we do that, we get our shadow, which we must be able to store on a classical computer. Until now, I said, ah, the classical snapshots live on the classical computer, but these are quantum states. So in order to store them efficiently, they need to have some special properties. For example, they can be the stabilizer states. Um, once we have our shadows, we use it, as I said, to construct these estimators, given an observable. But this is also something that the classical computer must be able to do. It's not obvious, for example, that this channel uh, is efficiently invertible. And once we have the estimators, um, we use it to compute the expectation value. But since we only have a finite number of samples, this will have some error. And this error is controlled by the variance. And so we will also have to bound the variance of these uh, uh, estimators in order to keep this epsilon error under control and know how many samples do we need. So the first one is an issue of quantum implementation. And the first point is actually the only quantum part of the whole process. And the rest is all classical post-processing. Point two and three are issues of computational efficiency. These are things that the classical computer must be able to do in order to run the protocol. And finally, the, first, the fourth point uh, is an issue of sample efficiency. So uh, how many samples do we actually need in order for this epsilon to be small uh, as small as we want it to be. And essentially, all of this depends on the choice of this curly U ensemble. And so the moral goal of all of this is to pick a curly U ensemble uh, that allows us that such that these four points are all well behaved for the largest possible class of uh, observables and states. 
So what was done in the past, in the original classical shadows protocol, what was the curly U that was chosen? Uh, well, either we pick one uh, random Clifford for each qubit independently, or we pick a big global Clifford from the whole uniform measure on the Clifford group. And of course, the first uh, ensemble is much easier to implement. Uh, well, the second requires linearly deep circuits in general. Then the computational efficiency tasks are dealt with uh, thanks to uh, the structure of the Clifford group and of stabilizer state computations. And finally, as far as how efficient the estimation is, uh, local shadows are very good at estimating local observables, while uh, global shadows are very good at estimating low rank observables. And namely, here the example is local Hamiltonians, and here the example, if we pick the observable to be a state projector, we can estimate state, state fidelities using this very efficiently. And the aim of this work is then to find a middle ground between these two things that hopefully would inherit all of the good properties uh, and none of the bad, <laughs> we hope, uh, between, between these two. So a natural middle ground, we find it in random quantum circuits. So these are the unitaries that we draw, and each box here is a unitary drawn uh, at least from a two design, but in practice, uh, the Clifford group. And I say that this is an intermediate ensemble because at depth zero, this exactly reproduces the local Clifford scheme, while when the depth grows beyond some super linear regime, uh, this approximately implements the global Clifford scheme. And this is a relatively natural middle ground, which is considered in other works by Hu and Akhtar and, and others. Uh, but in our case, we focus on the regime where the depth scales logarithmically in the system size. And this is for a number of reasons. First of all, this is easier to implement than global Cliffords, which in general require a depth which is linear in the system size rather than logarithmic. And so this takes care of the first point. And second, we have a natural framework for computational efficiency, which is given by tensor networks. And in particular, the classical snapshot was a stabilizer state in the previous case, in the uh, original classical shadows. Uh, now we store it as a matrix product state of one dimension polynomial in the system size. And if you don't happen to know what a matrix product state is, just know that as long as this one dimension number is, is small, this object can be manipulated efficiently on a classical computer. And third, well, these two points are great and there are reasons for picking a depth smaller than logarithmic, but why should we go all the way to logarithmic? Well, one motivation is that it is known that uh, log depth is the threshold for anti-concentration, uh, which essentially means that the output distribution of these log depth circuits already looks sort of like the output distribution of uh, global Cliffords. And so we might hope to reproduce the sample efficiency of the global Clifford scheme already at log depth, uh, which, is, which to some extent actually happens, as I will explain in a, in, in a few minutes. So this takes care of point one and two, and, but now we still to do this classical post-processing, which is possible in the, uh, in the Robin, in the Juan Kung and Preskill paper because of the group structure. Here we have no group structure. And this classical post-processing is all about inverting this quantum channel. And it was shown by Bu and co-authors that for, for a very large class of ensembles called Pauli invariant ensemble, uh, this quantum channel is actually diagonal in the Pauli basis. But furthermore, we show that in our case, we find an exact expression for the eigenvalues, which can be computed efficiently using tensor network contractions. It's not quite enough. Uh, we need still to invert this channel. And we do this for two different classes of observables. First of all, we have sparse observables, which are linear combinations of uh, few Pauli operators, for example, local Hamiltonians. And for this, we can do the classical post-processing efficiently. And then we have what we call shallow observables, which are observables given as matrix product operators. For example, if you want to estimate a state fidelity with an MPS target state. And for this, we use a, a variational algorithm for which, unfortunately, we have uh, no rigorous guarantees, but uh, we observe uh, good results in practice. And it's an open question to find uh, rigorous guarantees for this kind of uh, algorithms. So finally, now we have taken care of the first three points and we still need to know once we have obtained the estimators using these techniques, uh, how do we know they're actually any good? Well, uh, for this we need to bound uh, the number of samples that we need to obtain a, 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 an estimation which has at least constant accuracy. And this is in this table I summarize the results uh, of Juan Kung and Preskill. Uh, in which for the local shadows, they are very good at estimating local observables, only requiring a constant number of samples in the system size. 
while they are pretty bad at estimating low rank observables, in general requiring an exponential number of samples. And for the global case, this is exactly the opposite. They are good at estimating low rank observables, for example, fidelities, and not very good at estimating local observables. Uh, and importantly, these bounds hold for any possible initial state, meaning that the observable is the only variable here. Whatever state is thrown at you, this is a guarantee. While in our case, we show the uh, aforementioned middle ground property where uh, local observables are still efficient, only recognizing, uh, requiring a polynomial number of samples. Uh, while for low rank observables, we show that only a constant number of samples here required, but uh, this we show for only for a typical state, meaning on average for some reasonable ensemble of initial states. And whether or not this holds for just any state is an, is an open problem. And of course, we also provide ways to upper bound this error given some fixed observable. Uh, you might still be interested uh, in knowing how large this error is, and we provide upper bounds to, to the variance. Finally, I want to show you a plot. Uh, here we have on the left a fidelity estimation, and on the right a local observable estimation. And I show the estimation error as a function of depth. And you can see that depth zero corresponds to the local scheme, and depth infinity corresponds to the global scheme. And uh, the global scheme is very good at estimating the fidelity, while the local scheme is very good at estimating uh, the local observables. And our shallow scheme in between seems to already reproduce the same performance of the global scheme after quite a short depth, uh, while it preserves the good performance for the local observable still at the same depth. And so, uh, given this, I leave you with a short picture summary in which we, uh, we propose that this intermediate log depth scheme is actually uh, the middle ground between these two that inherits the good characteristic of both for fidelity estimation and, and local observable estimation. And with the summary, I now leave the stage to Mirko, who's going to talk more about this measurement channel.